square form of the Maybe if it's you just have to lean forward a bit. I have to lean to my side. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. That's a, that's a really nice angle for my head. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> look, look, Pat, look, I've got absolutely no hair whatsoever in the uh, in the lighting. Hello, everybody. Sorry for getting in late. I thought I had time. I, actually, James warned me when we had seven minutes left, uh, and I thought it was that was loads of time. But then we've been complaining about the blab, the blab not IM interface. Uh, which we're not terribly pleased with. I don't know if anyone was watching last time we used Lab, but you could actually go in and watch without having to log in with Facebook or Twitter, but now you actually do have to log in with Facebook or Twitter, which kind of makes it more difficult for people to uh, to join us and, and, and participate. It does um, add a barrier to um, participation. It would be awesome to get confirmation from anyone in the chat uh, if you're actually hearing us. I suspect they can hear us because I tested the audio before and quickly before I started looping around. Oh, okay. Um, yep, yes. there we go. Gabe says yes. And Sarah. Uh, Sarah's research says so going fine. Great. Okay, and, and someone great. is actually trying to call in. Um, okay. So we're going to accept Gabe. Just go for it. Which means we can't. Test the audio as well. Hey, can you hear me? Oh, in the, from the car. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, awesome. Hold on, on a second. Let's just test. Speak again for us, Gabe, so we can hear. Yeah, can you hear me? We're not hearing you. Not hearing you yet. Hmm. I thought I did hear something for a second. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Levels. No, Why? still no sound. No. I hmm. know. Right hello, hello. Just quickly try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can hear you laughing now. Can you, can, I think it's me from the. Can, can oh. you hear me? Oh. Yeah, see, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're getting that. It's always challenging to be the first caller. <laughs> I heard something. Yes, I heard you. The sound is actually going out to the television instead of ah. to our. That's where we can hear it. See, there, was yeah. this, there was this vague noise that we can hear you talking, but I'm we're not really sure where it's coming from. And it turns out that, because we're, we're sat here in, in a different part of her studio and um, using a TV that's on the wall opposite us. And her has now realized that the, the audio is getting mirrored to the TV rather than mirrored to our, our little, little thing here, which spits the audio into our headphones. That sounds much better. That sounds like except you're fiddling with your headset, so we can actually. Oh, sorry. There. It's okay. Ah, wow, perfect. Now it's all working. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yay! Oh, we have so many, so many cables. Yeah. So, Gabe Medina, welcome to the show. Hello, thank Gabe. you. Thank you. Nice to nice to talk to you guys. Wow, I'm a huge fan. Awesome. Thank Excellent. you. So where where um whereabouts are you and um what are you doing? Oh no, this what, is not what, happening. What, what he just vanished. I'm he just vanished. gonna do the intro bit. <laughs> so much tech problems. It's connected. Yeah, it's the it's, internet. It's just sticky tape and string. Yeah. Right? Sorry, what were you asking? Um, thank you for calling in, Gabe. I just want to ask, whereabouts are you, what you're doing, and what would you like to ask sure, us? Sure, yeah. So I'm in uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, principal UX designer at uh, Cyber. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, first off, I just wanted to say thank you for um, having this this podcast. I think a lot of times us UXers are in the dark and uh, you know in this scary world, and you guys are... I don't ever listen to podcasts. You guys are absolutely like a beacon of hope to uh, to <laughs> us. So thank you very much for having this. We always learn an incredible amount, and uh, you guys are hilarious too. So um, thank you for that. Oh my god! Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's 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 thanks, awesome. Thanks, thank you so much. <laughs> I try to plug your your show whenever I uh, mentor anybody. I think it's you guys are great. So thank you for that. <laughs> thanks. We 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 have a huge amount of fun doing this. We. We wouldn't keep on doing it if we didn't, I don't think. That's awesome. Yeah, I can tell. Maybe it's important. Yeah. Maybe it's important that we don't make any money out of this. Probably is. <laughs> Let's not make any money out of this. So could 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 well be onto something about that. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> so my my question, I don't know if it's a it's question slash concern. I'm not sure, but I uh, just want to get your thoughts. Um, so it's kind of around process. Um, what I've noticed is that a lot of uh, clients <laughs> are whenever cliffhanger oh the cliffhanger look at that <laughs> do a, a job for yes. after a, yeah oh, sorry you you, you, you froze you froze just as you just about to kind of mm. start delivering the, the kind of point and it just like froze which oh. was a cliffhanger for us <laughs> hang on one second <laughs> all right is that better yep yeah great. okay Works. yeah um I'm near work, so it might be trying to connect to the Wi-Fi, which is probably causing issues. So oh, I disabled Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, right. All right, all right. So anyway, um, uh, what what did you hear so far? Sorry, <laughs> nothing. S start your question again. Oh, your 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 <laughs> concern again. Okay, yeah. So, um, one of the things I've noticed with a majority, if not all, of my clients is that when I uh, do work for them, it doesn't really allow me to follow. Uh, the the process that that we like to follow in UX, right? So UX, obviously, you know, you've got your um, you know your strategy, your research, design, testing. Like for the most, follows you know a process. Um, and what I'm noticing is that a lot of times, um, you know, these new UXers that are going through their, you know, their their, their training and they're learning about the process, they're getting very turned off by companies that are pulling them in after the fact, after the product is live and out there. Um, and they're more interested in working with startups and new products um, so they can get in, you know, fresh with the strategy and all of that and not have to deal with um, coming in like halfway or after a product has launched. And so I started to look at my own clients and I'm like, you know what, I've, I've kind of experienced the same thing. I've, I've not come in, um, at the start, it's always been kind of, uh, you know, in the middle and, and I've, I'm, you know, kind of had to try to adjust and find out where, uh, where they need the help. And, 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 you know, you just kind of, every, everyone's unique, everyone's, everyone's different. So I don't know, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there and see, like, it, it was kind of sad to see that some people are shying away from, you know, like they're only interested in working with startups. Like I've, I've noticed that with a couple of people I've um, spoken to and they're fairly, fairly new to UX, but um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that is, are we, are we preparing people correctly by teaching them uh, this, this process um, or should we really make them more open-minded and flexible um, because it's so new and companies, a lot of companies are still trying to, you know, learn UX, you know, it's like there's that, evangelizing that I feel comfortable doing, but at the same time, it's, um, it can be difficult. You know, it's like, we're, we're what's, what's the future like for that? I think before we went on there, we, we pair actually just while well, I was reflecting on, um, how it is when, when someone new comes into your, your, your project, um, so you're, you're, you're a team is working well or something. And what we've, what we've learned, what we know from, from, from our experience is that when you um, when you bring someone new, new into the team you have to effectively go back to to the start um, you have to start from the beginning to let them you know come up to speed go through the story you know experience a bit of what you've experienced during the time you've been together and we, we kind of know that with these little project teams but exactly like you say yeah but that the organization as a whole I mean there's this people that want to work with startups people want to work you know don't really want to work with the big organizations how do you get that same kind of uh, understanding that mm. you do need time to kind of take on something and, and come into it? Um, I think what I'm saying there is that the organizations maybe don't have that patience. Exactly, and and willingness to persevere, perhaps also, mm -hmm. and to have that realization. But at some point, I mean, some you, know, you have to grow up. You have to realize that <laughs> not everything can be a startup. <laughs> uh, and I think it's an excellent reflection uh, because the funny thing about startups is that uh, most of them fail. Uh, and if you want to make a long lasting impression, perhaps you shouldn't limit yourself to working with startups uh, because it's sure it's great fun and, and you can do basically what you want or work the way you want, follow your process. But 
in the end, are you making the change in the world or are you contributing in the way that you want to? Uh, what I'm thinking is based on, you loosely have that question there, are we teaching people in the wrong way? Are we assuming that people need to learn this process when in fact they have to learn how to be more flexible in how they work? I, I would certainly agree with that. I think we're in the academic world talking too much perhaps about this stringent process that we need to follow uh, at the same time as I think it's important to adhere to it, but perhaps not have to argue it all the time in organizations. We've talked previously about perhaps following that process, but not in an obvious way if see, people seem to object to it. You still need to do the form your hypothesis and do the research and, and have your discovery phase, uh, but maybe you don't have to do it uh, in as transparent as a way as you would maybe uh, want to, but you do it and then you show the results and by showing the results that's how you get uh, buy-in for, for working in that way that way in the future. And also startup yeah, isn't yeah, a startup I'll... forever, sorry. Startup isn't a start forever. If you want to only work with startups then you have to jump around quite a lot <laughs> because the startup yeah. will mature eventually if it doesn't fail, yeah. so to speak. And I also agree that yep. you need to be a little bit more flexible. I mean, I think it's has, it has to do with how you can add most value. Is it is it by evangelizing and trying to convince the company about the importance of the process? Or is it to go in and actually add value in the stage where you happen to land in at the moment? I think it's a, it's a judgment thing. Sometimes if it's a long-lasting partner or a customer, maybe you can add value by it by educating them more of the process and that if they involve designers and UX people earlier, maybe um, the project will see a better result sooner. I think, so, yeah. I think as well about how, you know, we're, we're UXers. You know, one of, the, one of the characteristics of who we are is this ability to understand the, the user, the, mm. the, the target audience that we're, we're, we're building things for. Whereas, this this problem is is kind of the same thing. I mean, we, we should be able to read our employees and read our organisation yeah. and have, have some understanding, do some research, understand you know what are they looking for, what's their needs, what what's their behaviour, how do I design my role or, or my deliverables yeah. so that it fulfils the need of the organisation, um, and at the same time maybe a, a, a degree of um, persuasion, um, you know. It's, Behavioral psychology techniques to help the organization on a on a path of organizational change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, designing the UX designer. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's certainly something that we don't <laughs> spend enough time in UX training doing. Actually, understanding how to talk to clients or to our coworkers, or just explaining what we do, or deciding on what will our deliverable will be based on who's going to accept it within the organization so that they can do their best job. Mm. We're well, dovetailing now into um, design leadership or yeah. UX leadership, yeah. which, um, you know, in the branch now, we're, we've seen this last few years, how, how that um, is bubbling up as a, as a, as a layer in our, in our branch, our industry, mm. that needs more work as we're, we're reaching a level of maturity. Some of us now have been working 15 years or so and, and people are ma managing teams of people their organization started off with, with just them back in the bubble 2000 2001 and now they're managing a team of 20 across the whole range of products so so your skill set needed to deal with that is is very different and the world's different to what it was back then mm. yeah, can we come true. close to answering any, any question or where are we way off yeah 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 <laughs> no <laughs> No, it's it's good insight. You know, yeah, sometimes you just want that validation that you're you know you're not uh, being you know closed minded or whatnot. So I think that's that definitely helps. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, one other thing, I uh, just a side thing. I I do uh, as a hobby um, uh, music production and electronic music. So if you guys ever need anything, I'd love to help out. Excellent. That thank you. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Thanks, well, thanks so much guys. for calling us. Yeah. yeah, enjoy enjoy your day. Yeah. Of course. Happy Friday. Yeah. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. That's the first time we've had a caller the first minute. No. <laughs> Isn't it? Didn't um we have a call a year ago. 
um, a year ago. I don't remember that far back. Oh, um, I've got a vague memory. Um, mm-hmm. Now we did we did have um, we did have someone recording very quickly before. Okay, but now you'll have to prove me wrong. Uh, what by finding out who it was? Yeah, oh, I'm sure I can work it out. That was a really interesting question. Uh, I haven't given it a lot of thought, but I mean, you work in the academic world. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there is a rigid process that you teach yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, you guys talked with Alan Cooper, and one of his books used to be our Bible uh, about mm-hmm. face interaction design. Yeah, and along with design methods by Jones, so it was all about process and methods and tools that mm. we should be able to add to our toolbox. Right. But I feel like methods and those kind of things, all tools are just. There can't be better than the person actually using the tools, mm. so to speak. You can learn how to use tools, but you can't learn how to master them unless you do them in practice. Right. So I think... But could, could it then be that it's really a terminology issue? Because, in fact, it, it is about the process. If you don't follow the process, it won't work. And, and people are confusing the process with tools and mm. are saying that we need to do this exact type of research. We need to do these interviews mm. instead of doing going out and doing guerrilla research. Or mm. when we do our prototypes, oh, we need we need to use them, you do them in sketch. We need to do HTML prototypes, which isn't true, but you just need to follow that process, but figure out, okay, so how much fidelity do I need to go into in every step of the yeah. process? Yes. And yes, that's, yeah. that we don't talk enough about, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Because you know, mm. most situations are pretty unique the setup, the context, the customer, the people. So yeah. I think you can't follow the exact same process or use the exact same tools in all cases mm-hmm. unless you're very, very much a specialist. Uh, but then you have a very limited uh, right. set of scope. On I the, think... Yeah. yeah. On the last right. listener phone, and we talked a lot about tools, mm-hmm. when we sort of diss them, though everybody has their favorite tools. But it's important to realize that that's not the answer. That's mm-hmm. not part of the process. This is the tool. No, it's a tool. Yeah, mm. exactly. It's it's something <laughs> that that helps you do something. Mm. Yeah, um, and we actually following on from that um, conversation we had in the last listener phone in about um, um, design tools or wireframing tools in particular. Um, Adobe actually got in touch in, in touch with us. Yes, right. Yeah, um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, offered to put someone up for interview um, from the team that designed and created. Um, the um, Adobe uh, XD, the, uh, yeah, Adobe oh, XD. Nice. So, yeah. um, we haven't had a chance to to book anything in there or um, or work anything out. But um, but if you're watching, you can call in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you if you're watching, I think that's a good idea. You can, yeah. There we go. We have got some um, um, we got some high fives there for that idea. <laughs> we'll we'll try and fit that in and do it um, during the autumn, I think. Um, yeah. Right, so what else can we talk about? <laughs> We've been to UXLX. Oh, we got a caller. Oh. I see who that is. Isn't it Simon? Yeah. Uh, yes, Simon Kemp. Hey guys, can you hear me? Oh, I can see him on my one. Yes. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah there's a little lag there when you appeared on my monitor, but not on the TV one. Hey, hey you, Simon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. I can hear um, myself excellent. too. Fine. Fantastic. Excellent. Got that horrible little echo. Okay. And Good. you are calling from. <laughs> That's ah, okay. You're calling from yes. Sydney, right? From Sydney. I want to get my question in before it gets too late. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Good evening to <laughs> you. And, um, thank you for calling in on your Friday yeah, evening. What else would I be doing on a Friday evening? Right. Watching <laughs> golf, I think. <laughs> they, they turned the golf off for some reason. <laughs> Oh, yeah, really? oh dear. That's from Stockholm. <laughs> so it was uh, kind of relevant to this, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> In some way. weird way, yes. Exactly. Yeah. They, 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 there's only so much bandwidth, you see. So so they couldn't stream the golf at the same time right. as we streamed yeah. this. So yeah. we, we told them, just, you know, let it off it for now. Mm. So, um, well, which, um, yeah, we, we talked to you a couple of, um, actually, the, the episode I just mentioned in the chat that, in answer to the first question about who who called in during the first minute, um, it was actually Heather Burns 
uh, called in in September last year. And that was also the same <laughs> listener phone in that you called in. I can't believe you already checked that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Oh. Hmm. Okay, then. Uh, that's enough of us. Okay, I'll, I'll, so I've got, go a, ahead. I've got a quick question <laughs> for you. Um, I'm giving a presentation in a couple of months' time, and um, it's going to be covering Gorilla UX. Um, we talked briefly on Twitter okay. about this. Um, but, yeah, basically the premise for my presentation uh, is that, you know, we don't often have a lot of time time, budget, or access to users. Um, and especially in the enterprise space, uh, UX design is usually the first thing to get cut, which is unfortunate. Um, so I want to try to give people an idea of, well, what can you do with the limited time, limited budget? Um, you know, what would be the most important thing or things um, that, that someone could do to um, at least do some design? Um, I guess traditionally in the enterprise space, um, some will develop a functional specification or something like that. They'll, they'll believe they know what the users need. And there may even be a mindset of, well, they'll use whatever we give them because they got to use it to do their jobs. Um, and then we'll go away, build it. And then we'll have this thing at the end of the whole process called user acceptance testing which um, is usually mm -hmm. way too late. Um, if anything really serious comes up in user acceptance testing, you know, it's usually too late to do anything about it. So um, yeah. just trying to turn that on its head. Um, I try to get people to do prototypes um, as early as um, possible and go out, meet the users, do some testing on the prototypes, um, hopefully catch the big problems early on. Um, change them in the prototype. Uh, it's much easier to change them in the prototype than it is, um, you know, five weeks, six weeks into development. Um, but yeah, so like I was just looking for you guys and the experience you've had. Has there been times when you've done kind of guerrilla UX on a shoestring budget? Maybe you faced situations where people say, oh, we don't need to do that. Um, but you've gone ahead and done it anyway. Certainly. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's the most common question we get, or what I get when, one I, of them. when I'm out talking, is that how do I get buy-in to do what I want to do? And then I just answer, well, just do it. Uh, because uh, you will never get the buy-in if you, if you start, if your ambition is to start planning how to get buy-in. And the buy-in you get by, by results, uh, and you show results after you've actually done it. Um, so I, what I've done is um, I've used a lot of these online testing tools uh, like five s second click tests. So do extremely simple prototypes, sometimes sketches on paper, sometimes just wireframes, but even high fidelity ones and just put them out there. And with these online tests, I mean, you can get so many, it actually almost becomes statistically significant, which a lot of people are asking for as well. Uh, you can send out like um, pr prototypes online where you track where people click, you ask them a question, where would you click to get this? I'd click there. Uh, or you actually sh you sh they show it on a heat map where they click. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can ask what people remember from your website based on just sketches. And that's one, one quick way I do it. And uh, other things are, I mean, even <laughs> micro interviews. So often you actually, depending on what type of, type of client you have, but in the enterprise, some, if you work with intranets or you're at meetings where you have contact with clients, I actually take like five minutes after a meeting and just take someone aside and, and start talking to them. So just find those micro interactions that can actually help you get more information, get more data about what's working, what's not working, and then use that and present it as we've done this research, even though because it is research, even though it's small. Guerrilla research. Oh, yeah, guerrilla research. Yeah. I mean, the the, the stand, what part of the standard answer I give to this question is to refer back to um, to to our to the workshop we attended in um, 2011 with Russ Ungo. Um, and he was doing a workshop around that time about guerrilla research methods. And, um, and it's, it's one of the most eye-opening and, and fun um, workshops I've taken part on. Um, it, was, it, was, it was at UXLX um, in Portugal, and, and Russ has us going out and doing user research there and then outside the, um, the venue. But he, um, he, did some, he gave some really good 
um, kind of take homes from that. There's some really good uh, nuggets of, of in, uh, in, um, inspiration to kind of get you to do things. Um, one of them was um, about how you should you should get out there and do stuff like you said, Pat, but um, only do so it's a bit of a lean UX or lean research kind of thing. So only do as much research until the point of least astonishment. So, so when you stop being surprised about what you're finding out, then that's enough. You can then go and, and build a hypothesis, build something based on that, that user research. Um, and uh, on the back of that as well, you, you, the most important thing you could probably do as far as research is getting out there and observing. So um, any other forms of research is, is interesting, is good. But if you can actually watch someone using your product, it's, it's worth a huge amount. Yeah. Um, that's not always easy. Um, if you're in, I know you work a fair bit with um, enterprise um, systems, yeah. um, and sometimes people say that it's really easy to get kind of you know get to observe enterprise customers um, because you know who they are and it's very kind of big deals and the rest of it. But my experience is sometimes it can be a nightmare getting getting to view um, well enterprise customers because you've got um, you've got sales guys or customer responsible people who own a client uh, own a customer and they would get really suspicious about why do you want to why do you want to come and visit my my client mm -hmm. and then and the client themselves say well why do you want to come and watch us you know you know we just buy the product from you i mean you don't want to watch us using it but um but if you can kind of network your way through that jungle then sitting down by the side of mm -hmm. someone whether using your, your your product or a prototype of your product you've got one with you because you can yeah. if you're there already sat next to them you can show it Russ himself was talking more about the, the kind of coffee shop gorilla uh, research, where you you would just you know turn up at Starbucks and um, and whip out a prototype <laughs> yeah. and, and get some feedback. And we even tried doing that, and it was, that's what we it, did. It works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. With the enterprise stuff, it's a bit harder to show up at Starbucks. And say, exactly. <laughs> so that's where the networking like comes. Receivable process. How do mm. you you know? They, they probably you know it. what I just thought of that I, that I actually do a lot of now nowadays is I record a short video of me explaining uh, like the sketches to their wireframes and going through them and explaining them like six minute videos because there's often this <laughs> time frame where you have to get the feedback because developers have to start with the next sprint uh, and you just don't have time to book all these meetings with all these people so I send out that video and, and either I just attach a small survey to it or I call them up after they Presumably, presumably, hopefully, looked at the video and get feedback from that. And that's a great way of just sharing just one piece of information with a lot of people and getting feedback on it. Right. I'm going to come up with another suggestion now as well. Oh, you see, now you've got me thinking. <laughs> um, another idea is, is through recording a video. Are we doing an episode now, or is this just one oh. call? <laughs> I will cut this bit out if it's not any good. No, just the whole thing about you're, you're going through something, you're explaining it, aren't you? Yeah. So, so that then is a user experience. It's user testing in itself. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so if you yes, it is. So if you if you explain it, mm. and you realise that a certain aspect of it is difficult to explain, mm. or even that the response you get yeah. requires yes. further explanation, mm. that is actually so good. Now you've mm. got mm. you've got input now mm. into mm. maybe um, scenario mm. planning, and you can actually create something. Okay, mm. that was a bit of a that we hung up mm. on that bit. Mm. Um, maybe we should go out and mm. and take just that aspect mm. to Starbucks or mm. you know another round of prototyping or sketching mm. or you know some kind of breakout in that sense this part is hard to explain yeah self-discovery yeah just you know what it got me thinking of is this a whole episode now or just a like, <laughs> phone call from a listener <laughs> um, when I tested all these read speaker stuff that the, they read aloud your text from your blog post what, what started happening was that people realized oh my god I can't write it like this because when they heard it aloud then it became mm -hmm. a different point mm -hmm. point that they were making. So they actually just edited their post based on the, it being spoken by the computer. Right. And that got me thinking. So if you're re basically reading your own interfaces to yourself and not understanding them, that's a user test. So the take on <laughs> so that little thing we created there was that you should you should write down your prototypes yes. in words. Nicole Fenton last year at UXLX. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so as a form of as a form yeah. of self validation or testing. Now I get what she means. There we go. <laughs> Takes time. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing to add. <laughs> it's getting long enough. All right. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs>
It's time for me to leave, is it? <laughs> I just, we thought we'd time to let it's you so speak. It's so funny because I think in, in our instructions oh. on, our, on our live page, we say, we'll keep each call to five minutes. We have never had a call stay at five minutes. <laughs> okay. Should I, should I take the hint and leave then? No, or? you know, reflections. Reflections. What do you say? Yeah. What do you think, Simon? No, it's good. Um, I've talked to a few people about this and um, had some really interesting answers, I guess. I'll share one or two of them with you. So one person had piggybacked on a performance test. So they already had people testing the system for performance. Um, but during the performance test, they had a lot of downtime as they switched between scenarios. So she actually just sort of in that downtime started asking them questions about how do you use the system, oh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah. she didn't have to arrange any testing, really. Mm -hmm. She just had to be filling in the gaps, which was mm -hmm. really good. And, and another person I talked to said they had developed a, a set of personas. Um, and what they did actually was put all the personas on the back of the toilet doors. So when people were in the bathrooms, they could you were sitting there look, looking at these personas, learning about people <laughs> that they were developing for. Um, That's excellent. Which I thought was a big, cool yeah. and easy way um, to, to, you know, get people on the same page. So it's like the whole thing about like, you know getting moments of inspiration in the shower and maybe in the toilet and something. So that, that that's actually pretty quite a yeah. good idea. Yeah, you should do waterproof ones so you can have them in your shower. Yeah. <laughs> All right, no, that's great, guys. Thanks for that. Yeah, Thank and, you. Uh, Thank and let you. and let us know how the um, presentation goes. It'll be interesting. Yeah, to, we'll do. Some, you know, Thank you for staying that. up so late. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. I look forward to listening to the episode. See yeah. you later. Bye-bye. Yeah. You're right. It's very difficult to keep these calls to five minutes. When, um, when, when, when we get three going. Of us, when we get going. Yeah, yes. we, <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even let Dan <laughs> say anything. I feel a little bit bad about no, that. No, don't feel bad. Well, come on, now Sorry. we can fill in now. <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting when you talked about... Uh, the astonishment factor. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. Research until the point of yes. uh, least of astonishment. Yes. Yeah. And there's something uh, when you do qualitative research. Mm -hmm. um, when, in quantitative statistics, there's numbers. There's a certain number of people you need to ask in order to have this reliability, validity and stuff. But mm -hmm. in qualitative research, the number isn't that important. For example, when you interview people, yeah. you have deep interviews and you go deep into mm -hmm. this stuff. And that's also when you reach the point when you don't get anything new, mm. the astonishment factor is yeah. getting low. That's yeah. when you know you can stop. Mm. Yeah. So I, I like that. Yeah. It ties in as well yeah. with the whole um, like five users might be enough yeah. for usability mm -hmm. testing yeah. because, um, yeah, you, you don't get surprised when you've, 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 you've found like 80% of what it is mm. of, the, of the problems. Um, and if your budget, you know, if you are restricted with time and budget in a, well, everyone is, but yeah. <laughs> um, severely restricted. Yeah. Then, um, and yeah, it also has to do with finding the right people to talk to. Mm. And um, I found in my work that I've, even now as a PhD student, I've gotten tasks or projects handed over to me. And I, so far I've gotten two, and I've never done what they've asked me to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've always gone back and talked to the people that this is supposed mm. to be with and try to find someone, even though they say that there's no time for that and they've yeah. already written the brief, I always try to find someone that's willing to talk to me by going to that place and then keeping contact with that person throughout the project so that person sort of becomes my persona. Okay, um, excellent. So I guess that's one way of finding someone that's interested enough in the project and is sort of curious about this UX design mm -hmm. stuff and wants to be involved and learn more while he or she shares yeah. things from his perspective or her perspective at mm. the same time. Yeah. And what you said now that we didn't talk a lot about is actually uh, you need to think about who you are into doing, who you're talking to. Mm. Uh, so when we're saying walk into coffee shops, that's a whole different ballpark because that's a different type of service. That's a service that's for everyone. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, the, the specific target audience is yeah. less relevant like at that stage of your For your enterprise audience, it's specific people. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and you have to be really sure when you talk about your the research that that does not mean you can talk to just anyone. You mm. still need to think about who you're talking to. Yeah, I think that's that's why we went into the the idea of, of 
like self-reflection or kind of internal research mm. or internal testing and such because in many situations you're, you're so strangled that you can't talk to any users yeah i mean you really don't mm. get any buy-in from anybody to go out there and talk to your enterprise mm. customers or whatever so the only people are, the only thing that's left is that you've got to make slightly better guesses because mm. mm. that's what it's all down to if you can't do user research you just got to guess better mm. and, <laughs> and and maybe this this, this suggestion we had about um, writing down your your prototypes in, in, mm. in words or recording videos describing them yeah. then that's that maybe is the way you go forward for yeah. helping you guess better yeah. because you you you're working on it you're rehearsing mm. it inside your team or inside people that are working close to you or the testers if they're yeah. if they're involved and testers often are really good people too. I'm really going to work that into a workshop now. That It's an excellent mm -hmm. thing to do, to try out. So it needs to copyright things quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right. Um, I want to show you, I tweeted this yesterday. Are you, you're now showing us something. Can I we... tweeted this yesterday. Oh, yes. Right, do we do we read it out then? Because yeah. they can't see it from the, the camera know. on the blab. Yeah, I'm just saying, I tweeted this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I see what you're doing. Oh, yeah. okay. How many interviews should I do? In quotation marks, and that's and then me answering. Keep doing them until you are not learning anything new. You can go ahead and retweet that. So you're, you're, <laughs> to put it in the no, no, don't close it. Put it in the. Um, you've got to take it from yeah. there, right? And then you've got to paste it into the the chat channel there, right? God, it's all the time. Or, times. Yeah. So, um, oh yeah, people. I don't know if all of you guys who are online now and and perhaps don't know about the chat. You can actually ask questions in the chat. I think there's a VJ just um, uh, made a little comment there um, in relation to Simon's um, call. Uh, but um, VJ says he um, could emphasize, uh, empathize with Simon. Um, easily turns into a design by committee approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you, I yeah. mean? How do you make that not happen? Uh, I think you need to ask, uh, we need to be more upfront and asking, what are you basing your opinion on? How did you come about that opinion? And, and realizing that it is an opinion as well. Is it you that feels that way or is it someone you talk to? Yeah, ask mm. why questions yeah. why. Mm. Mm. I think, um, uh, well, and the other thing is that you're going to get something out there. You know, if you don't fail completely to start yeah. or whatever, or your product doesn't get closed down, then then whatever you're working on, even without user research and without user testing, is going to end up being put out there. Yeah. So, what I would then hope is you build in analytics or ways of measuring the UX of your product or thing you've designed, mm. so that you can continue to get answers or be, be enlightened and, and make better guesses post-release, even if you've not done a single moment of, of usability testing or user research, because yeah. you then, you're kind of backfilling your user research by using analytics. Mm. Right. Yeah. If that's, that's, that, was, that was kind of an answer to Vijay saying about the, the design by committee. I mean, sometimes I think it's, it's just going to happen. You're going to really, you know, the, the, the flood from the organization is too big to stop it from being designed by committee. Um, so you then have to just backfill mm. and you can... And, and, and analytics can help you with that. So we have a question in the chat room now by Lacey J. White, if I can read that correctly. Uh, do you have any advice for a daily or weekly UX practice, especially when you don't have a real project at the moment? Thinking of something other than UI, which is easy enough to develop a daily practice for. I'm thinking for specific methods and ideally not in isolation. For example, do a task flow of another product or guerrilla usability test, as I believe the key to being strong at UX design is thinking in terms of the entire system. I have some ideas for side projects that would, of course, flex my UX muscles, but these aren't going to be complex systems. Separate from that is actually, is it actually helpful to, helpful to say, do a content audit, go another for another product yeah that's it for knowing that. you don't have access to the business objectives etc walking and type oh, <laughs> oh, oh, now we get the walking, yeah. walking and typing yeah right okay yeah. <laughs> uh, this is walking and typing i so. love how this is so this live yeah uh oh this is interesting it's, it's a really good question mm -hmm. and i think we've had this we've had a similarish question at some point not maybe not on the live bit but we've mm -hmm. we've talked about this before what can you do like you're you're a graduate, you're someone that's coming out from school, and you you have you know getting that first job. How yeah. can you how can you kind of brush up on your real UX skills 
um, before you get that job or between jobs or between projects. This is like this. I'm seeing this as between projects. Like what, what yeah. can you do? Like yeah, like exercises. Yeah, like One, some well micro moments of I don't know learning. Yeah, uh, I know that um, both me and you um, have before that we've uh, we taken if we've noted as as, as people we are UXers and so on you, we notice things constantly that you are going to get hung up on irritated by could be improved yeah. so so we've we've recorded not together separately but we've we've taken things that have irritated us and then we've done video walkthroughs explaining the issue and then explaining how we could do it better and maybe even doing little mock-ups and so on yeah um, and that I find I don't do it often enough mm. but um, that is a good way of practicing um, communicating so communicating issues mm -hmm. um, and also communicating um, design suggestions as well as the analytical side of things. It's kind of what is the, what is trying to be achieved mm -hmm. here? Um, how could I achieve it better? Plus, you're also showing, supposedly, if you share this with other people, you're also showing what you do. Mm -hmm. So becomes, you're communicating your profession to other people. And it becomes a bit of your UX portfolio yeah. in that you can then um, give an exam. You can point to that example um, rather than a real case, and that's that's true also when it's like maybe you've got non-disclosure agreements or you mm -hmm. work to a client that doesn't allow you to talk about them. Mm -hmm. So then you can you can do a review mm -hmm. of a similar um, product with a similar issue, yeah. um, mm -hmm. circumnavigating mentioning that particular client. Um, but but I think sorry, did you want to did anyone else want to add something before I dive back into Are you this going question for another episode now? Yes. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, this Lacey here asks um, specifically about more. Now, th that example with the video is, is very much an interaction. It's a goal, it's a task, it's a particular flow. Mm -hmm. Here, she asks as well about the bigger picture, you know, like how do you simulate the organization? Mm -hmm. um, the, the daily practice of the, the, um, the, um, the thinking in terms of the entire system, and you know, how does she do that when she doesn't have um, um, business objectives or kind of the, the, the rest of the organization mm -hmm. that would be with you if you were doing a product or coming into a, a, an organization. Um, that's a little bit more complex, of course. Yes. I wonder if there are any cases. I know for business people, they can solve cases where like fic fictitious um, challenges and situations. I don't know if there exists something for uh, UX people, like solve fictitious UX cases. Mm -hmm. Where, where there's a description of maybe uh, the you know, fictitious users and case and stuff like that. Maybe that could be useful practice. I don't know if there are. Well, any find your own. Because, I mean, yeah. people are getting upset all the time online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every time James walks in the store, he's upset about some new website. <laughs> and, and, I mean, as long as you write down what you're upset about, you should spend all these moments trying to redesign mm -hmm. whatever, you, <laughs> whatever you thought was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and you, you have to just. You have to just guess what the business mm. objectives are. Yeah. Yeah. Or in some organizations, you can actually find on their corporate websites, you'll find their mission statements and mm. visions and so on. Um, or maybe there's a quarterly report. I mean, there's information out there that can probably mm. give you a pretty good idea yeah. what a company is about. Um, I wonder, too, whether you could buddy up with someone. Yeah. So, so effectively, take this role play um, one step further and, and reach out to someone and say, do you mind being my my fictitious CEO or CTO, mm. whatever. I mean, can you can you be the business mm. and get them to join the role play with you? Mm. And that then could be beneficial both directions. That like you've, you know, you've got someone not being the bad guy as such, but someone testing mm. out the role of of being the business and the business objectives in mind and, and the large, large organization. Mm. And then you play out the, the UXer. Mm. Yeah. Or reach out to startups. And do oh, yeah. something for for a startup. I, th I, I I believe that they always need help for free. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Who doesn't need help for yes. free though? <laughs> oh, that's a good um, good suggestion from um, VJ here as well. Um, you could get um, get a hold of historical um, um, proposal requests uh, from customers. So basically, you could just make a collection of of ten you know, RFPs and tenders that have been put out there. Mm. Yeah. Save them somewhere in Dropbox, and mm -hmm. and then you know if you're bored one day, pull one out and see if you can answer it. It's not a bad idea. Uh, okay. okay, there's lots of discussion going on now. Her specific question about is it is it useful to do a content audit 
or is it helpful to account it on for another product? Um, it's interesting um, because we always feel there's a yes and no, yes or no answer to these questions. Mm. Uh, my reflection is that you don't know until you've tried and you always learn something. But we spend so much time thinking about, will this be useful? And it's, I think it's better to actually throw yourself into it. If it fails, you fail, but then you learn so much and then you, you will be the one able to answer that question better next time. Yeah. Um, I, had, um, I had a chat with um, um, a contact of mine in Stockholm a few days ago. Um, he, he quit his job, what, four years ago to be a freelancer um, and did three years of freelance. Um, but then he got the opportunity to um, cover someone for parental leave during a, a year. Mm -hmm. And I know not in all countries this kind of opportunity exists, but here in Scandinavia anyway, that you, it's quite often the case that you, there's, there's jobs that need to be filled for a year while someone's taking care of their family. Um, it's, and he jumped in and took over that role for a year. Mm -hmm. And you learn a huge amount by doing those kind of um, you know, um, parental leave cover. Mm -hmm. um, that you, you get, it's time boxed. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you do want to continue as being a freelancer afterwards, you go in for that for the for year to, to learn how it is to be inside there. Yeah. Uh, that could also be another, okay, that's, that's a little bit of a sidetrack, that's actually getting a job, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're talking about between jobs, mm -hmm. but um, but it might be mm -hmm. an option to look at, you know, can I switch for a while? Yeah. You know what I thought of when I, when I first read her question was, what I'm doing these days is, since I attended my coaching course, all my one-on-one -on -one talks with people actually become sort of me practicing coaching because it's me asking powerful questions, open-ended questions, and practicing my presence, being there with that person, looking into their eyes, checking my body language. Mm -hmm. And it's so powerful because it's totally changed how I perform user interviews. Mm -hmm. Cause it, and it really helps people trust me more. And so I'm, I'm always experimenting with how much can I get this person in front of me to open up. Mm -hmm. And that's something to flex all the time as a UX writer. Mm -hmm. I've I've actually reflected on the fact that since you did your coaching course, yeah. that I've actually I think been better at getting people to to open up to their um, and explain their, their their not fears as such, but their obstacles. What's holding them back? Mm. You know, when you get asked a question, it's kind of like well, you can then throw it back on them exactly um, rather than answer it. Sometimes. Exactly, don't answer questions. That's a good thing. Actually. Yeah, ask questions, don't answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, so it, just you know, it's actually getting really warm in here now. <laughs> it was, it was warm to begin with, but I, I'm realizing that these cushions. Guys yeah, yeah. got these cushions, and they're really nice. But, but they're wet now. <laughs> oh, my, my, I'm getting so warm from this. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna try without. I'm gonna try without that for a moment. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The thing is, we can't open the window either. It's really hot outside as well, but uh, there's noises outside, so we can't open anything. Yeah. That's the back downside of podcasting. What, that is hot? It had to stay in... Well, soundproof spaces are really right, okay. getting really hot. <laughs> oh, I have to say thanks very much for that question. So, doesn't anyone want to call it in? Come on. Uh, I was saying before, and, and as um, was pointed out in our chat by Adam, uh, you can attend UXLX for inspiration, and we did last week, and we got lots and lots of inspiration. And we met Adam there. Yeah, actually. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, the wink, I think, was why Adam did that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we've done a lot of interviews. I think we did seven interviews with a total of nine people. Oh, wow. Uh, which will be all coming out over the next three or four months, I think, because we're not pushing them out in one day. Um, I think I think with the fact that we've got the listener phone in now and we've got, um, we actually got an interview, we're doing straight after the, um, the, the this live listener phone in, we're doing an interview um, with a guy from Google who is gonna talk to us about material design, which is something that regular listeners will know that we've, we've tried to explain ourselves and we've also tried to get hold of people to talk to it, but Dan Way actually used her influence and contacts to um, to get us to talk to someone at Google about it. So, um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to post them. Maybe you guys yeah, can exactly. Yeah, that'll be actually Ask cool. Yes. Um, we can save them for, for later. So that'll be an episode that kind of gets sandwiched in, in between the, the interviews from UXLX. Um, but 
the, the kind of flagship interview from UXLX was, of course, with um, Alan Cooper. Alan Cooper, um, who whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Alan. He's turning 63 years old today. Yeah. He's 20 years older than me. Oh. I, killed, <laughs> I don't I killed, know. I killed I that know. conversation. There we go. I don't know what to do with that information. Um, no. Yeah. Okay. I don't know either. Really. <laughs> but I, um, yeah. No. So Alan, um, I don't know how many of you listened to our little. We did a little clip um, of our interview that we put out to our SoundCloud side channel, which we do with all the live interviews we do. We put them straight up there in the clips, and then we put them into the shows on the regular RSS feed. Um, with with that one, with the Alan interview, we didn't do it. We didn't put the full thing out at first. Um, Partly because it was over an hour, and, and we wanted to. He did open up a lot, um, <laughs> as he said on Twitter. Um, I spilled, I, I, I spilled my guts to those Swedish guys. I think he's, yeah, he said what he said. Um, so we wanted to kind of lis- just listen through it and just tidy it up a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if we'll put out the raw material at some point in the future. We'll see. Um, Do we want to give a T-shirt? To, I mean, because I thought we would. I thought we'd take out the bit where he basically. Um, has a dig at Bill Gates. Ah, I good you said that. I didn't know if we should say that. But yes. Well, no, we should have left it in. I know, but it's pre-episode. But they're getting right. bonus material now that they've called in. <laughs> yeah, he really tears into Bill Gates. Uh, and his philanthropy. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the kind of thing that, you know, philanthropists don't do stuff for the world, they do stuff for themselves. Mm-hmm. So Alan was quite... I mean, he was very reflective. He was, yeah. um, you know, it's on the back of his talk at UX, UXLX, which was, which was a very um, emotional speech for him. And he'd been working mm-hmm. on for a long time. And it was, it was very reflective about the industry, mm-hmm. the state it's in, where we're heading. Mm-hmm. And he's worried about where we're heading um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a planet, I guess, as people on yeah. a planet. And also as designers um, creating things and, and startups are a particular yeah. um, thing. He's, he's basically become to dislike them a lot. He doesn't like startups mm-hmm. at all anymore because they don't have... They don't really have the user in focus. Hmm. Their, their sole mission is to line someone's pockets with money, hmm. which kind of goes against this kind of UX thing where we do stuff for the, for the good of the user. For the good of mankind. Yeah. We want to create a better world. I don't know how many UX companies I've seen who actually have that as a tagline. We want to create a better world. For people. Well, don't do evil with Google. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, but, oh. Um, what, what is Microsoft's tagline? They've changed it several times. Um, I don't know what the current is, but when I was there, it was uh, uh, realize your full potential. Oh, really? Or help you realize your full potential. That's interesting. I I just realized I've never thought of Microsoft as having a timeline. (laughs) I I don't think (laughs) most you're aware of most companies' timelines. Google has been very vocal about theirs. Exactly. I don't don't know. Nokia had connecting people. Yeah. I remember that. One. That's right. Yeah. And Apple think different. Yeah, think different. Yeah, there's occasionally they they come up there. Mm-hmm. Um... So you have to realize that I mean Alan Cooper and he just doesn't talk bad about any rich guy. He knows Bill Gates. So I think it's it wasn't that bad. It, it's sort of no friendly banter between the two of them. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it was. But it, no, it was more. It was more the whole thing about you know like you said about lining you know, people who are rich enough kind of getting richer mm-hmm. and and I mean I I mm-hmm. we question him about whether he was talking about dismantling capitalism, mm. whether he was kind of, mm. you know, raising the red flag and going full on socialist. Because yeah. at times he comes across in the interview as very left wing, mm-hmm. um, but he's but at the same time he's really really not. He's he's a, he's kind of you know Republican, you know, right wing as as, yeah. as, 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 as a, uh, probably a vast majority of Americans in their sixties, you know, maybe are. And he says, "I love capitalism and I want yeah. to be rich." And he's saying that straight out. Mm. But he wants us to. He just want there's, wants there to be more control mechanisms in place for companies so that they don't do so much bad as they're doing right now. And I know we're preempting a lot of the interview, or you're listening to the interview. But <laughs> one of one of the suggestions there is that you know, we are the ones with the power. We are the ones with the responsibility as designers. Oops. Oh, he, hold on. Can, that was my uh, Skype. I just got a Skype call. Um, oh, and you answered it as well, there. <laughs> Only salespeople have my Skype and phone number, so <laughs> somebody, somebody said somebody, hello, and I just somebody in Sweden doing a sales call live <laughs> in front of a UX audience. There we go. Um, I don't think they can hear. Uh, maybe not. No, they, um, no so, so that we, we're the ones with the power and the responsibility to to stand up um, in situations where we're, we're, we're producing things that don't add to the world, don't mm. do good. 
and, and that we maybe should back off from that and think twice before we do it. Hmm. No, I wasn't there, so I don't know what his talk was about. So it would be interesting if they decide to put it up so people can actually see. His yeah, talk. they should because I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, now we just went straight into yes. it, but it's really hard to explain what he really said because sure. he wasn't talking about UX. <laughs> well, of course he was in a sense because it was a UX conference, so he's talking to UX mm -hmm. people, but about being a good person. Uh, but based on his experiences when he bought a ranch five years ago and learning how the food industry works and all the bad things that comes with that and realizing that the people close to him on that farm are out of a job and not being able to do the stuff they used to do because everything everything is now industrialized because it's so much cheaper mm -hmm. to produce meat and milk and stuff uh, in in factories. And what he did though, of course, because he, he's gone, because he spent the last five years building the ranch, he, he ref during that process, I mean, his, his, his experience, his business experience was from the design world, from programming mm. and tech yeah. and design. So so he was, of course, drawing on his experience um, from those decades in, in, in that industry and reflecting upon his experiences going building up the, the ranch and realising the similarities and realising how, you know, you know, his neighbour's dairy farm had closed down because of, you know, too much openness and free, too few controls um, to, to, to stop kind of bad things happening, kind of like commercial farming as such on a, on a, on a really high intensive scale. And he saw the same mm. thing in the startup world mm. and that you know, there, was a, there was a drive within tech to generate tech mm. and money rather than do good. Right, and, and, the, and the reason being for this happening, of course, is that we're not aware that it's, hap it's happening. Because if, if we were more aware, I think it wouldn't happen in the scale it has already now, because as we become more aware as consumers about factory farming and the impacts on environment and animal welfare, we're making different choices. But this was happening over 20, 30, well, even longer than that, probably, uh, year period. And we just didn't see it coming. And now we're seeing all these people who are out of a job or out of a business and the people who actually cared a lot about the work they were doing. Uh, that work has now been handed over to people who don't care as much as about the about our even our, our our health or 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 the number of vitamins carried carried out in the milk because that has changed as well of course uh, and and it's just I think for Alan it has just struck him uh, at a at a late age now and he just wanted to realize that well he's been part of that as well uh, in the way that he has worked previously and he has patents and now he hates how patents work and how it really limits uh, the, the good work that people can do and put out there. Um, so, I, yes, he's a guy, he's still thinking, and he, he did a really good talk, but he's asking a lot of questions again. And, mm -hmm. But it just makes us think a lot more and realizing that the world is being created by people who create, and we all, as UXers, create stuff, and so we all have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. We're not, and I like it what he says, we're not to blame, perhaps, but we have a responsibility to do our best. And maybe have the power to. Exactly, yeah. yeah. He quoted, well, he almost quoted Spider-Man. During my talk, I had my on my Spider-Man t-shirt because that was actually a part of my message as well. With great power comes great responsibility. If anyone's wondering what I'm doing, I'm actually writing a message to Bruno, who runs UXLX, um, asking if he's, when he's going to publish the Alan uh, video. Multitasking. Mm -hmm. Trying to, although Facebook are really not helping me. Uh, because I don't have Facebook Messenger installed because it just every, the Facebook world takes up so much space on my devices. I don't have space for it, so I installed it, and I use the web version, the touch website um, of Facebook, to to deal with messages. Um, now I just tried to go in there, and they put a thing up saying, "We're moving to Messenger. You can't use the web anymore. Yeah. We're moving to the app," which they did in the app yep. a year or so ago. But you could always do the web. Mm -hmm. Now on the touch interface, they're saying no. So, so now I have to go to the full web version to get the messages. All these barriers just to just mm. to make me go into their app world, and I don't want it. Cause mm. It's all down to their marketing. They just want my exactly. data to and link me across yeah, exactly, devices yeah. more and more. Actually, can do that's also down. Alan's point. Uh, he was talking about Facebook. He was talking about public libraries, except they aren't public anymore. And there are public spaces where we go to interact. Uh, they are owned by someone. So, even though Zuckerberg perhaps is not the most evil guy in the world, we don't control it. So we don't know what's going to happen with the stuff that we do there, or how our data is, is going to be treated, or if we even will have access in a way. Or, I mean, if we can say what we want on 
Facebook. And I know that in Sweden there's a big debate going on because I mean, we can't publish any photo, just any photo, because if you publish a photo on Facebook that shows any, uh, it shows breasts or naked skin or whatever, it just it gets deleted. But showing people holding big handguns, of course, is allowed. Mm. <laughs> this, is, this is back to the big Europe-America uh, debate about what's okay and what's not okay. Not going to go there right now. What topic do we want to bring up? <laughs> Oh, I think Simon's just worked out, um, well, 20 minutes ago, he tweeted and worked out why he was getting so much echo for him. Um, he had Blab open in two, ta in two Chrome tabs. Oh. We've had that one of the earliest times, haven't we? When we had, Ooh, we had it okay. open, we clicked on links and it had opened up another window. Yeah. So. No, but I think it's interesting, the, the discussion about what's good and bad for people and the value and everything. Uh, I, I don't know where I stand really, but I, I like... What Wittgenstein thinks about ethics, mm -hmm. and if you guys have time and anyone is listening and interested in a, and another maybe a different point of view, you guys can search for Wittgenstein's ethics, and there should be a PDF, I think, of a transcript of a course he held. Wittgenstein was a philosopher uh, of logic and languages and logic of, of math, mathematics, and he his point was that ethic debating what's good and bad is like a, more of a word game. Because you can't really say what's good for everybody. It's always relative. Just like with value. Mm -hmm. um, what's valuable it depends on what someone else is willing to pay for it with whatever they want to pay for it. So saying that something should be more valuable is a little bit difficult since everything is pretty much relative in his point of view. Yeah. That uh, is yeah. Her is finding the, um, yes. the PDF yeah, that's the one, while Dunway talks and He's posting it to the note. There we go. There we go. Everybody has to be here. You just beat me to it. Okay, you have, each of you have about seven minutes to read it, and then we're going to have a, <laughs> a quiz. Q, a Q and a Yep. Yep. <laughs> Actually, we've just passed uh, 3 p.m. here in Stockholm. Uh, we've had two callers as of yet, and this episode, it's actually going to be a 30 minute episode. We'd like, though, for for at least two more people to call in, which would be nice. We have answered questions that came from the channel as well, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, but it's nice for some video mm -hmm. um, conversations too. Um, we love to hear your voices because it's a radio show. It is indeed. Mm -hmm. You only have 55 minutes left before we melt completely. <laughs> you have that idea of bringing ice in here for next time. Yeah, but oh, we have strawberries. Ice. I forgot about the strawberries. We strawberry. do have strawberries. Other people can see. Mm -hmm. Um, here, Danway uh, brought some strawberries with us. So now we're going to do what you shouldn't do on radio. Eat. We're going to eat live. You know, video too. We're going to eat live. Because we always <laughs> eat after the fact, otherwise. Well, no, you won't. <laughs> you eat dead things. <laughs> and we have actually headsets on. So I have absolutely no idea how how bad it really sounds when you're chomping, chomping on strawberries. Um, yeah, them. but yeah, these had, oh seats. yeah, these headsets, but they're not being picked up by them because they're picking us up on that microphone. Oh, oh yeah, that's sorry. Yeah, that's your microphone that you're listening to is here, and this this one that these ones we've all got attached to our heads for the podcast itself. Mm. Mm. Oh, nice strawberries. Mm. Oh man, were they Swedish? Mm. They were. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> These are fantastic. They were good. Always choose mm. Swedish strawberries. Mm. You should always choose the strawberries of the country you're in. Oh. <laughs> because it's a transport thing. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. Um, good thinking. Because if it comes from your country, that is actually what Dunway meant. <laughs> I don't All know. Right, then I just helped to explain it a little better. <laughs> I iterated it. <laughs> mm. So, um, we did actually have a question. Um, uh, what I was going to say before you oh, say that right. is that take before break. when we did this, you're, you can add a tag in the chat and the question pops over to the left hand column. Remember that? Oh, yeah. How'd you do that? There's, there's slash Q. So you do slash, okay, slash, slash Q, Q and then um, you write it and then it pops up to, uh, yeah, so, so, so that so we don't miss your question. So, like that. So, so you, that should appear in your screen. So you have to make sure you don't miss it though. Oh, that was a bit delayed. Why? 
Oh, I, I now get a question it, saying why. Now they've changed the interface. Oh, oh they have yes. changed it. So it comes up as a. Oh. It just gets an, a different icon. All right. In the chat. I'm not sure that's as good. No. Why is all this white space over here on the left? Oh, well, yeah. If somebody can figure that out for us. Yeah. Um, Blab please. is. Um, <laughs> we're kind of realizing we're developing a bit of a love hate relationship with Blab. Mostly hate. You reckon? <laughs> no, but I mean, it, I think it actually works. I think it actually works pretty well as a as a live platform for doing this with mm -hmm. the with the questions down the, the side, the video, the call of video. I mean, certain aspects are fantastic, but they've been they don't reply to my mails when I'm kind of giving them feedback, um, and I've been nice. Uh, you have been nice. Well, at least the first time I was really nice. The second time, uh, when they ch changed the login so that you were forced to log in, I was less nice, but more. But I was more blunt. You were threatening to leave them. And what would they do without the Yokes podcast? <laughs> All right. All right, I threatened them. Oh, maybe it wasn't so nice. <laughs> and then they were like, okay, good riddance. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to apply to him. We don't need him. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I wish you could taste these strawberries. How could you even describe the taste? They're so no. sweet. Joke out. That's it, you're eating food at the same time as people are asking us questions. They aren't. Yes, they are. There's two. There were two questions are waiting. Well, one of them was from Vijay. There was one of them from Vijay, and then we've got another one from Lacey. Um, <laughs> shall we? Um, all right. Oh, okay. I'll go out to Vijay's. Uh, yeah. Vijay's was um, asking if we could highlight um, the role of UX in upcoming trends like uh, virtual reality, Internet of Things, and share experiences. <clears throat> This is now when Dunway explains her. I don't. People. Your dumb people. Your dumb people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Well, for those, not, for those people yes. that don't know, yes. Um, so, you just quickly say what you're doing your thesis about. Yes. Well, my thesis right now is about sketching with unfamiliar media. So sketching with anything that's not like traditional paper and pen or square rectangular computer screens. And one of my projects is about enabling designers to sketch full dome presentation, interactive full dome presentations. And this is a 360 inside of a kind a of dome, a dome. yeah, a light bulb yeah. kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, it's like an upside down bowl. Yeah. And you sit inside and mm. screens everywhere. And you're not off to the side, you're in the center. Yeah. Oh, it's different setup. Yeah, Some but that's, that's the speaker. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how do you mm. sketch a presentation or anything that's supposed to be shown inside this bowl shaped room. Uh, so that's one of my take. And, um, and we came to the conclusion that that pen and paper is not enough because there's something, you know, immersive, a feeling of immersiveness when you're inside that dome that's difficult to convey or uh, evaluate or experience when you're not sitting inside a dome. So how can we pick up those characteristics of immersiveness and give it to designers who don't have a dome at home so they can do work even when they're not inside a physical dome. So we're looking at solutions like VR <laughs> or something else, like just having a virtual dome model on the same screen. So when you're drawing on the flat surface, you see your sketch being sort of morphed into this little model. It's like what architecture maybe do. They build small models of what they want to, want to build. But if dome people or dome designers just sketch in a small scale, Will that convey the immersiveness anyway? So that's something we're looking into: how to sketch and how it should feel like, how the sketch should talk back to you, so to speak. And um, I don't know; it's very little has been done when it comes to UX and design perspective in the VR and the AR world. It's mostly right now tech enthusiasts who wants to push the technology forward and see what they can do, uh, but not so much focus has been on usability and what the user should. Um, experience in this type of environment mm. and that's what I'm mo mostly interested in and in, in more specifically how to sketch for these type of environments. Mm. Yeah. I, um, I, I bought um, one of these Google Cardboard mm. and VR viewers mm -hmm. the, the other week. Um, to, you, know, you put the telephone in the, in right. the front of it and you hold it to your, your head um, and, um, and there you've got like an interface because it's, it's got a it's got a pretend button 
well, it's not pretend, it's a button, but it touches the screen. Mm. So in that sense, it's pretend, and it's mm. just a, it's making it effectively a really weird shaped finger that's touching the front of your screen while it's attached to the headset. So you've only got one, you've got a single input. So you've got, uh, well, you've got your head movement. Mm. Something about interaction design now. You've got your your, mm. your head movement, mm. which is also moving the view that you're getting in the headset, mm. and then you've got a single button you can press. Mm. And and so far the, the apps I've tried, I mean, it, well, literally you've got to look at stuff, mm. and and then maybe you have to press the button. Mm. So you, you can le left, right, up and down with head, and then click, um, and that really limits your yes. your your means to interaction. Yes. Um, you know, writing becomes impossible. Mm. Um, complex m instructions become difficult. Mm. Um, Certainly, cardboard because cardboard's a, a kind of fixed, a bit like your presentations. Like you're, you're you're in the middle. You're at a fixed yeah. point. You're not wandering around no. the virtual world. You you're stood somewhere yes. and then looking around it. Um, but I haven't really I haven't really reflected so much on how you could no. do it better. I'm just noticing the kind of um, one thing I did do was make the the connection between material design and VR. Mm with how material design is trying to be more based on physics the real world and, and layers and, mm -hmm. and shadows and so on and how when you when you have got, when you've got interfaces in a in a vr headset they also have to adhere to a certain amount of, of the real world because yeah. you're, you're submersed in a mm. virtual world so if you're if the thing your if your interaction panel or whatever you want to call it is too disruptive yeah anything? clashing it, it doesn't it doesn't meld properly into that because you're already you're already basically you know thrown off kilter as a, as a individual because all those senses balance and the rest of it have been messed around with because mm. you're inside a vr headset so so if you then add to that by making a, a kind of odd interaction system that doesn't feel organic and logical in in, in that vr world then i reckon you'd be, throw, you up, you'd be throwing up even quicker in that case, I have to tell about something. I was at the CHI conference, CHI, Computer Human Interaction Conference, in San Jose a couple of weeks ago. And they had an exhibition place where I think it was Microsoft Research that had a um, Minecraft exhibition where they were trying to uh, enable sense of touch in VR. So what they had was a table and a cube, just a regular cube on the table. You put on Oculus Rift, mm. and they had a connect on the ceiling that could sense this particular cube. So when you put it on, you saw a cube in the virtual world. So you reached out to grab it, and you could move it around. You were grabbing this physical cube, mm. so you could sort of feel it. But mm -hmm. um, it told you to put it, place it at a certain place. So we put it there, and then you pushed a button, and a second cube showed up. Ooh. And when you reach out to grab that cube, you were still grabbing the same cube, so you could move it around. So it felt like you were building stuff with several cubes, although in physical... It was always world, the same one. The same how did you, but how did you... They oh, just that is fantastic. They just recalculated the movement because you saw a virtual hand inside the virtual world. Oh, so no. It, I wanted to reach out that way, but when I reached out there in the virtual world, I was, like, all the way there. So I had to, like... Oh, so they were, they were using deception. So yes, they, they were, yes. So they were manipulating yes. what you were seeing yes. to trick yes. your eyes yeah. into tricking your brain yes. that you were grabbing yes. there, yes. but you were actually yes. grabbing there. So oh. It was very, very strange. But after a while, you sort of, okay, this is how it works. In this That's really world. freaky. Yeah. So I, I was building powers with just one cube, but it felt like I had many cubes. You didn't feel tricked? You didn't, you... In the beginning, it felt very awkward, but after a while, you just start to accept it yeah your brain accepts it yeah, yeah you've yeah, yeah. you've, you've just, adjusted yeah. your understanding yes. of reality yeah. to, to think that's actually mm -hmm. not that weird uh, yeah. you cope with that yeah. that the movement oh. is a little bit different in this world maybe it's like how it is when you're swimming i don't know when you're diving <laughs> it takes a little bit more to move and here it takes a little bit less to move. i don't know maybe that's a bad comparison but it was like you have to move less to move as much as you wanted to, but in this virtual world. So. I, yeah, guess you're, you're I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're suppressing the physical response because yes. you, you, you're then relying more on the visual mm. inputs mm. and suppressing your physical side. Maybe. Yeah, oh, that's a, no, yeah. there's so much we can do to trick the brain oh. into actually thinking and doing stuff, but what will that do to our minds? <laughs> there's, yeah. this, there's this yeah. psychology experiment where you can... The, subject puts on a coat 
and puts their right hand on a table. Their left hand they keep close to their body, mm. but mm -hmm. the sleeve of the coat is is still on the table, and there's a, like a yellow glove or something that sticks out of it. And so you're sitting there, but it looks, for a non-looker, it looks like someone who has the, both of their hands on the table. But of course, left hand is fake. Mm -hmm. And then they take a, a brush or something and start brushing your hand, your right hand, and you can feel it. And then they take another, br another brush, and they're brushing both hands, the fake one and your real hand. Mm -hmm. And after uh, a few minutes, you start feeling mm -hmm. the left hand that is a rubber glove as if it was yours. Yeah. So you actually just shy away when p people try and hit it with a hammer, and you're like freaking out. Because you think it's hitting your hand, but that's not your hand. Yeah, I, I really. And it goes really fast. Yeah. There were videos on YouTube about showing this. It's 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 crazy. Mm. <laughs> like Chris Nossel was saying as well, wasn't yeah. he? About some guy who did some experiments mm. uh, with he had a belt, some kind of mm. belt on. Um, it was a navigate. It was some kind of feedback system. Mm. Oh, I can't the details of it now. Mm. Where it vibrated on your wrist to tell mm. you left and right and mm. so on. Um, and and after keeping this on for a while, he took. And took it off mm. and said that he'd actually developed um, a tingling. So, so every time he turned left, he had a, he felt a vibration um, on his left side, even ah. though he was no longer wearing the belt. Because after three months, mm. he he developed a, a, an automatic mm. response to direction. Ah. So he he developed a sense of north mm. by having. That's right. It was a belt that set that yeah. vibrated when he was pointing north. And, and after, th I think, three months it was, he actually could feel when he was walking north, even without the belt on. And this is really interesting because that there's now research being done around how people have like these like ghost vibrations from yeah, their so, phones. Yeah, exactly. The it, same thing. That is the same thing as amputees had, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and what I was saying before about the hands and the rubber hand, uh, after World War One, with some of the amputees, you, they could, I mean, people can still feel their limbs. Yeah. So when they develop these boxes, where there's a mirror inside, and the problem with with the limb miss, missing limb is they couldn't, the body or the brain couldn't determine where it was, so it's trying to make sense of where it was. So they look they look box with a mirror inside. So you look inside the box. They put in the right hand, the right arm, which is the only one arm they have left. Look inside, and then the mirror shows them having a left arm because it's mirrored. Mm -hmm. They're looking inside the box, and then and then the brain starts figuring out, okay, here's the arm, and th it's sort of like the brain relaxes or resets or something. Because then they ha don't have those. Well, what is it called when you have that feeling? It's it's there's a word for it. Phantom phantom pain in their yeah. amputated uh, parts. Yeah, mm. and it disappeared just mm. by tricking the brain. And that was exactly what you did with the cubes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> reverse engineering. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. Basically, I don't know if you why don't you why don't you ring in and and, um, and post one of your questions. There's a couple of questions you've had in the chat, and I don't think we've had. Um, um, we don't think we've answered them all, but but it'd be cool if you could just like quickly ring in and and post one of the questions. Did we even answer a question? Yeah, we did. Um, we did answer one of our earlier ones, but then she's come with some more. Bringing the VJ's question about UX and virtual reality. That's, that's one we were answering. We're talking, yeah, we were kind of. That's right. We we, we were sharing in our stories. own way. We were sharing stories <laughs> related to it. Um, but that said, I suppose we can finish off that a little bit by saying that um, both um, um, Amber Case um, and Chris Nussel. Um, that we've interviewed recently, yeah. they both have interesting things to say about um, internet things and um, calm technology mm. and um, uh, agent agentive technology. And um, mm. even Don Norman was talking about it, um, uh, bots and things, mm. we to that with, with him. Um, One common question that's being debated about bots these days is, of course, should it seem like a human or should it not? Uh, where I, well, that's my interpretation of Chris at least, is that you should be able to tell it's a bot because if if you after five minutes figure out you're talking to a bot and thought it was human, then you're going to feel shaked. And also, interacting with a bot, you're probably going to uh, be okay with it not being able to give you the answer if you know what it is uh, from the get-go. Whereas a lot of people are arguing now that you need to get a sense of who that person is. It has to have a personality. I think you should certainly can have a personality. But without having it seen not too much of him. Oh, Lacey's calling in. Oh, there we go. Hello. 
that working? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Cool. Excellent. I, 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 I love that. I say. Um, and doing a quick call in. I don't think my question is worth a call in. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my last question was just kind of a silly one because there didn't seem to be many call-ins or engagement. I was curious, uh, just for fun, what is like kind of a ridiculous like product or service that you wish existed that didn't? For example, something completely ridiculous right now. Uh, my friend has a hardware company. I'm hijacking one of his sensors and I'm going to put it inside my tea because I'm not competent enough to actually like drink my tea before it gets cold every single day. So I'm just going to set up something that notifies me once it gets below a certain temperature, um, which I'll probably still pause it and forget to drink it. But I was just curious if you guys had any of those kind of first world kind of silly problems of silly services or products that you might wish existed. I think pretty much every single Internet of Things invention <laughs> so far is one of the yeah, we'll go on that list. The connected fridge, I guess. Mm. There was an excellent one last year that you expect. I don't know who, who talked about it, but shoes, uh, like Dorothy shoes, like oh, Kansas Dorothy yes. uh, from The Wizard of Oz. So when you're out on a date, uh, mm. you can click your heels together on these shoes and it will call you so you can get, get out of the date. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was, it was kind of like um, escape route shoes. Yeah. So these were Dorothy red slippers that were, were pre-programmed to, to call that your best friend or whatever so that if you were having a really bad date... Then you just click your heels together, and it would it would signal to your friend that they need to ring you up to interrupt your date, so you can say, "Oh, no, sorry, I've, I've, I've got to go." Um, just but, make sure you don't have such a good date that you're getting excited and just clicking the heels together. And <laughs> oh man, that, that's such a tough question. Oh. That's a very tough. Question. I, I think I keep thinking of I keep thinking of products that I've I've found and and wondering just why would you do that rather than kind of imagining new ones. I keep thinking. Mm. Well, that's my my story. I've, my story. I've said before about I, I bought a kettle. I think it was when we were talking to Don Norman. I was sharing the story. I bought a kettle that couldn't boil water, and that just kind of blew my mind. That you know, I bought a thing that does something so fundamental as you know, boiling water. It's it's a kettle. It's meant to boil water, and it didn't go any higher than ninety degrees. Mm. Uh, it's a coffee maker's kettle, really, mm. I suppose. But um, but it raises an interesting point about how we get you know in the connect the connected fridge when you. You, you, you're saying, oh, well, your fridge will automatically know when you're running low on a certain product or, or so on, or even about the ideas that um, a fridge will, will, will lock itself down at 11 o'clock to stop you overeating. Um, but you, you've got focus on such a, a narrow, um, isolated goal or feature that you, you ignore the real-life reality of the situation. I think Amber Case brought up mm -hmm. the example of that with a fridge that locks itself down to stop you eating your diabetic friend comes around and really needs some food to kind of counter the, the you know, sugar balance and and that you have to get a crowbar to the fridge to burst it open because it's it's in lockdown now to stop you eating so so we, we we have a lot of this with new products that were so tunnel vision focused on a feature that you forget the real real yeah, life reality you, you of it think about solving the problems in everyday life that are yours but don't pertain to everybody in the community around you. I'm thinking of stuff from just regular, I, mean, I forget to bring stuff in the morning. Sometimes I walk out the door and I have to return three times because I forget stuff. There should be, like my doormat should be telling me what to bring and know what I haven't bring, brought out of the door, stuff like that. When I when the kids have to come to dinner, I'd like just to be able to push a button because I know that they're in front of a screen. They're always in front of a screen. <laughs> push a button, it's dinner time, come along. Just block them from starting League of Legends because they have, if they're playing League of Legends, they can't come to dinner. They have to keep playing, or they they'll get locked out of the game. Yep. Yeah. I said problem with my, with my son as well that he'll he'll say wait wait when I say it's dinner yeah. time. And but now I've I've actually learned I need to I need to ask him. Okay, look, it's dinner time soon. How many minutes have you got left on this yeah. round? Or how uh, many is it till the exactly? That, that so you plan dinner around when <laughs> League of Legends will finish. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tangents. I hang up. My post is still be sitting here. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's fun. It's a fun question, and it, it does make you reflect and think about the absurd world. I think that we could live in and do live in. Yeah, I, I often attribute it to the new rise of you know being of entrepreneurship. Um, of course, that's always like been the founding, at least in America. But the new rise of entrepreneurship and the you know democratization of tech and like everybody feeling that 
if they're not being an entrepreneur and they're not contributing in that way, then somehow they're failing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think that that leads people to just find anything that they possibly can to try and build yeah. and try and fix, uh, mostly just to sell themselves. Um, and, and I'm usually oh, yeah. based in Silicon Valley. I'm in London right now, but so I might be in a bubble where that's pretty much mm -hmm. all I see everybody building anything and everything because if you're not you're everyone's just kind of wondering like who you are and what's wrong with you it's a, it's a good point and it makes me reflect on um kind of like high school projects or or, or sixth form projects in england or, or here in sweden kind of a gymnasium or oh, project where, where you get kind of a gang of 17 18 year olds and you got told to start a business and you kind of come up with these crazy ideas and, and the focus is like it's about learning how to run a business mm. but it becomes exactly like you say this kind of you know we're, we're setting the seeds for you've got to come up with an idea and you've got to make it work and you've got to sell it yeah. no matter how stupid it is and it doesn't matter if it's not needed anymore you've, you've just got to sell it mm. and that that forces into not thinking enough about whether we're making a positive difference with what we're exactly creating. yeah i haven't thought about that as much because it I'm, I, I like the fact that people are experimenting, they're, they're trying out new things, because that's the way we'll find new things. But you're absolutely right. I think there is an inflation in, in people just thinking they have to do it, mm -hmm. because that's how they are perceived as valuable in society, which, of course, is totally wrong and is something we probably should be countering as well. Definitely. I think def definitely listen to it, the time to listen to the Alan Cooper interview that we're pu pushing out next week. And next week after. Yes. Because I think he'll, he'll say things that resonate with what you're thinking and, and saying now. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, it, it should be refreshing. As I said, I've been in Silicon Valley for maybe 10 years now, and I ran away to London. Um, <laughs> you at least get away for a little bit. I'm going to get the boot in August, likely, because of the visa situation. But it's been oh. very refreshing to get out of that environment because the conversations that you have with people, even those in tech, um, see, they're, they're very different. Mm. So I, I'm really looking forward to the Alan Cooper talk. Cool. Excellent. Right. Thank you for calling in. Lacey. Thanks, Lacey. It was nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And something I'm realising is I'm actually not being as good this time uh, of noting down who we're talking to, um, so I can uh, summarise that later on, or even when we do the actual show. Um, you two fill in while I'm while I'm dealing with these things. Do you think? <laughs> Oh, it's just like too high. You know, so uh, I actually have what is it now? Oh my god, it's three working days left before my summer vacation. Oh, yeah, only three. Nice. three. Are you going to make people outside of Sweden now feel bad about how much holiday you have? Uh, it's been stressful, and I'm leaving for a vacation this time a bit earlier than is common in Sweden. But in Sweden, we do have this. Uh, tendency for people to actually take at least five weeks of vacation during the summer and I know that there's a big cultural clash cultural clash there because people outside just don't understand it mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, of course it's a big hassle for people trying to get in touch with someone in Sweden or do business <laughs> or do, exactly do business with someone in Sweden during, at least during the month of July it's impossible well basically until school starts around well, from the from, 19th of August or something like that. Well, kind of from back end of June until the middle yeah, of after, August. After mid it's almost yeah. two months where you're going to really struggle to get decisions made. Mm -hmm. You might get in touch with someone, but you, you're going to struggle to get decisions. They'll be sitting at their summer house. Yeah. Or they'll be in Thailand. <laughs> uh, so that was just me bragging about going on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to Tanzania. Uh, oh. It'll be interesting to see how much Wi-Fi I can get there. Uh, of course, in, in, in the big cities, uh, that won't be a problem, but going on a safari will be interesting to see. Uh, I, I won't be surprised, actually, if they have like routers out in, in the villages where we're going. Uh, I'm also trying to see if I can hook up with some, with some tech people. There are meetups they have there teaching uh, young people to code. Uh, that would be excellent to attend as well. 
Have you been to the, the place? Before? I lived in, I lived in Tanzania. Okay. Uh, actually, when my kids, when I was the same age as my kids are now, okay. eleven to fourteen. Oh. So I'm. That's part of the trip. I'm going to show them where I lived. Oh, nice. Yeah. But it has. I mean, just this. But it must have changed a lot. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. This mobile boom, yeah. it's just changed everything. Yeah. They, it's changed how they do business, mm -hmm. how they communicate mm -hmm. with the whole world. Uh, um, they had skyscrapers now, the roads are paved. That mm -hmm. wasn't the case when I lived there. Mm -hmm. uh, just how the fishermen come out of the boats, still these like carved out canoes, uh, but once they get to shore, there are bikes waiting there with people to take the fish to the market because they've already called them mm. on their phones from at sea mm. and they've already uh, set the prices based on the people they've already texted with who are at the market yes. so they've shaved off like hours and hours of each day of doing that stuff manually before more face more in face-to-face -face yeah. meetings yeah. interesting how the tech infrastructure sort of ties into their way of living exactly. in a nice way and even the payment i mean that you pay via text oh I mean, so in that in that sense, they're actually ahead of a lot of yeah. the Western countries. Yeah. So that you have mobile banks because yeah. that's the banking system. Yes. You don't have real banks or the banks that we traditionally right. have. Yeah. Oh, and talking, we were actually talked to Stephanie Rieger uh, last week at UXLX as well, and she was talking about all these changes. She, she said there was two hundred and sixty-one different mobile payment systems around the world. Hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. And there's so much we don't know about because we always talk about our banking systems mm -hmm. and our different social. I mean, mm -hmm. th that's also something. There's like 800 different social media networks. Oh. We talk about three. Yes. <laughs> or four. <laughs> and search engines and where you buy your books. It's all different in different countries and in different parts of the world. And, and I think we, sh we should be more aware of that as UXers as well because yeah. it, of course impacts how you design and we're not looking at the different interfaces of all these different types of networks that are essentially doing the same thing but they look very different in different countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah there's that natural barrier when you when it's like in um, you know, Arabic scripts or, or mm -hmm. Asian yeah. um, scripts um, that's straight away you don't really know what's happening with the um, with the interface so you can't you can't mm -hmm. just incorporate it in the same way you can some of the Western um, uh, you know, products and features and um, mm. websites. Um, mm. But um, yeah, it can be very different over there. Yeah, over there, he says. <laughs> <laughs> so Lacey is going to Sweden. Yeah, um, we've, we've you've started a little bit of a <laughs> conversation off about holidays. Um, people are a little bit taken by the fact that you are five weeks <laughs> in a row. Um, or I should say yeah, six I, weeks. Yeah, so um, I take, yeah, well, I actually take longer. I take seven weeks now. I don't know how. No. I actually don't know how weeks I take. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that I. Well, the thing is that to, not defending our holidays. Uh, it's one of the. It's one of the reasons why I'm a freelancer. So I love the time we all have during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, just that, um, like we said, you know, for me as a freelancer, I, I, I really can't do much with my clients during the summer. They're not there, yeah. and and when they come back, they don't. They're not ready to kind of talk to me or bring me on board. Right. So there's this kind of this kind of natural period of about six weeks where. I actually have to try to get work. Mm. I think really properly got my way. And I mm. find it's, it's easier just to work enough during the rest of the year mm. so you don't have to. Because it's actually quite stressful if you, if you, if you, work, if you work, have to work during the summer. Mm -hmm. That's really not fun mm. because it's so no. difficult to land last minute deals. Exactly. Um, so I avoid that was it. my biggest worry as a freelancer starting out actually was would I have enough money to last the summer and would I have enough clients starting up after the summer? Mm. Because as it's two months, it is two months actually. Yes. That you just, it's hard to get hold of people. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's different. It is, um, <laughs> as Vidya points out, um, different cultures, different perceptions. Yeah, yes. yeah. and and go, linking on to looking back to what Leslie was saying, all this is experience with um, quitting Silicon Valley, going to work in London for a while until mm. a visa runs out. Um, it's it's really really beneficial if you can can mix your cultures and, and mix your experiences in that sense. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've changed country once, uh, moved from England to Sweden. Um, I mean, we've all pretty much, I guess, jumbled down our cultures a bit mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but the, uh, giving a big plus to, to UXLX again, that it's very multinational going to 
Some, yeah. some conferences, not just USLX, but some of them are very multicultural. Well, Adam's calling. Oh. Um, Guys. Hello. I can see him on that. Hey. There he goes. Yay. Hello How's there, it going? Um, Adam. Hey, Adam. Can you hear me? It's very well, thank you. <laughs> We're hot. It's, it's very... We're it's, hot it's, in all definitions of the term. It's very warm. Oh, this, um, well, you're just enjoying those strawberries, hey? Have you, um, have you, um, oh, have yeah. you been in your sleep wow. now? Yes. Have you uh, caught up in your sleep? Yeah, that was a, a tough week. Tough week. Um, but definitely very, very... Uh, um, inspiring and there were so many good things that came out of that so <clears throat> it was definitely worth the uh lack of sleep mm -hmm. uh, adam was at uxlx um mm -hmm. the last week for um for those of you who, who weren't there and what were you doing <laughs> didn't meet adam. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, <laughs> exactly where were you? Um, actually, no, I just wanted to pick up on your point about, um, finding work and stuff. Cause actually I'm, I'm in that kind of that phase right now of, of between contracts and, you know, I, I get work from, uh, from London or from, you know, from anywhere that I can really, um, in Europe. Um, and I just, just kind of was posing. Because you're based exactly, in, you're yeah, based based in Portugal, Portugal now. now you are. Um, and so I look for European contracts as well. Um, but I just kind of wanted to ask where, you know, how, how do you go about kind of finding contracts, finding clients? Do you, do you look for tenders or do you, do you just kind of go directly through recruiters? I mean, how, how does that work for, for you? And, and what would be your advice on trying to find new work as a freelancer? That's a very good question. It's a very good question, and um, as usual, there are there are several answers to it. Um, the the first thing, though, though I think is is where you are in your career, or or rather, yeah, I think career is probably the best way, way to put that, because when you when you're first starting out as a freelancer, the answer to the question is slightly different, maybe to how it would be um, after ten years. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been a freelancer ten years this um, this August, um, and also there's the personal choice side of it how do you want to work as a freelancer so so this is this is the kind of first you know fork in the road um do you want to be a contractor or do you want to be a consultant do you want to try and mix them um maybe i'm kind of playing with definitions a little bit here but but when you're doing contracting work this is where you maybe you would you would fit, you would disappear completely into a project for you know for a period of time 100 percent um, and then the consulting side is where you would you would have a series, a set of clients where you would do some work at various levels of, of um, time levels, the amount of time you need investment into the um, people, um, and you, you would need several. Um, but that involves often some more sales, and that the contracting work maybe would involve going through um, some kind of um, cons you know, consultants or some kind of agency that would then put you in touch with the people that um, you're going to work for. So that's a bit of a, a kind of a choice. You know, what do you want to do? How do you want to develop as a freelancer? Um, then, then we're down to the thing about you know all of us. I think all of us are freelancers hate sales. Um, we don't. I'm not a freelancer because I like selling stuff. I'm I'm a freelancer because I like doing stuff. I like I like the feeling and the buzz when I I help clients make a difference. And and also, I have to earn some money as well. That's kind of one of the necessary side. And, and, and the seven weeks of vacation. <laughs> the seven weeks yeah. of vacation, um, or three months of the entire year. I mean, there's it's certain pluses of doing this, but um, <laughs> but I think what you did, Per. I mean, you can tell your story a bit, but you 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 started in a different way to me. I started as a, a, a bit closer to Adam. I mean, I I moved country to a country. I didn't really have the network. Didn't really have mm. the the contacts, and, and and spent three or four years working employed before starting to, to realize that the way I was bouncing between jobs um, short term was effectively the same as being a consultant. So I might as well just be a consultant and, and claim ownership over that, that, that world. Mm. Was you went a different way? I went a different way. And, and my story, of course, is hard to repeat if you already are a freelancer because I waited <laughs> a long time to become a freelancer after I already, already had been blogging about UX for 10 years, after I already had built like a brand name around myself uh, which also meant I don't have to spend as much time 
in sales because people actually find me because I've spent a lot of time being out there and giving talks and, and uh, that's my way of selling is, is just allowing people to find me that way, sharing a lot of free stuff uh, and that's how I build my brand. Um, what I'm thinking is uh, what has helped me the most, I think, is not trying to reach out to potential clients, but to reach out to my peers and my peers being people in the same general industry, but also um, uh, developers and, and graphic designers who learn that I am someone who they appreciate because when, when clients are looking for, for people, they don't just go out and look for people. They go and ask whoever they already know. And you want to come by recommendation. And coming by recommendation is the most common way for me to get work, actually. Uh, same for me. Yeah. I, I, I don't sell them anymore. So right? just, just making a lot of friends <laughs> yeah. is, is, is a good thing. And I like making friends. I don't like sales. <laughs> making, making friends and, and not letting people down. Yeah. Because if you, mm. if you, if you actually deliver mm. stuff, if you actually mm. make a difference... People remember mm -hmm. that, and then people come back to Interesting. you. Um, and and mm -hmm. that's how it develops over time. Um, so that's why I said in the beginning about you know, the short-term thing for you. I mean, going to UXLX in Lisbon was a very smart thing because then you um, you get in touch with people in the branch. The downside of UXLX is that it's so international, so you didn't probably get into touch with so many Portuguese people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's some there, so it's... It's an opportunity to network with them. Yeah, no, I mean, I did, I did yeah. meet some really interesting people. You guys, for instance, um, but uh, but also like there were there were some other Portuguese people there, which was which was quite interesting for me um, to kind of ask them about the the the, the state of the um, of the industry there uh, in here in Portugal. Um, but I also got the opportunity to talk to Nathan. Um, I forget his surname. The, uh, uh, one of the one of the workshops, mm. Nathan. Yeah, yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, so yeah, so I spoke to Nathan. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> um, and I spoke to him about uh, about kind of breaking into the U.S. Uh, market. Um, and he told me that the reason why that you probably can't get many contracts from the U.S. because because a lot of them are remote. Um, he said that basically it's it's just easier to employ U.S. Uh, citizens in the U.S. as a U.S. company. Um, so I felt and found that quite interesting to to find out because obviously I was sending my CV off to, to loads of places and saying, hey, you know, look, I, I can do work and here's my portfolio, have a look. Um, and they were all coming back saying, if you're not in the US, then sorry, um, it's not going to work. Yeah. So, yeah. Nathan Curtis. Nathan Curtis, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, and to, to flip that round, um, it's a two-way thing there. Um, my... As a, so as, as a freelancer, my, my company's insurance, mm -hmm. um, it specifically excludes me working with U.S. companies. Interesting. Because the, the way that, they, the way that the, the America is so um, um, lawsuit heavy or legal heavy, I mean, you're, you're really open to, to, mm. to being sued um, in, in America. So, so European or Swedish insurance companies, um, they don't include it in their normal business insurance. Um, you have to have special business insurance. And... Um, and then you need a certain type of company to get that type of insurance that covers you to work with America because of the higher risk <laughs> for um, for doing consultancy work with America. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah. So Europe is your thing because yeah. you've got a lot of more opportunities within Europe. I still want to leave you with, like with one recommendation when it comes to sales, <laughs> <laughs> because what I found is that it's so hard to sell just generally sell UX services, but find a niche. And for a while, my niche was I, I read Luca Belusky's book and then I got into forms and I started marketing myself as doing forms and being really good at that. Mm -hmm. And that did not mean that I got to do a lot of forms. It meant that people <laughs> it found it easier to talk about me and mentioning me. Oh, the guy that does forms. OK, I'm just not the guy that did UX, but I, did, I was the guy that did forms. And uh, now I'm still now again, I'm the UX guy, but now I built my brand further. But the, finding niche things that you can talk about, it helps people put you in their head and rem remember you more easily and, and bring you out when they need to. Interesting. Perfect. That's really good advice. Thank mm. you. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Adam. Mm. Okay. Great. So yeah. it's so nice seeing you again. Yeah, thank you. It was yeah. great to see you. Talk to you again soon, Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.
slightly more difficult for you to yeah. invite in that question because <laughs> sure, as I far as I know, you have not been a freelancer. No, I haven't. And you aren't. So. No. so I don't need to do the sales part. But um, I used to do evangelism. I felt a little bit like pre-sales. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 When you were Microsoft's yeah. Um, yeah, evangelist. Yeah. Yeah, the... So I knew how it felt like. But I, I never had to sell my own services, so to speak. But it's more like raising awareness. Mm. And I... I I can I hear what you guys are saying. It's not about selling your service, but it's more like making friends and making people trust you as a trusted advisor mm-hmm. more, and think about you when they when they are in that situation when they need help and that it is your name that pops up yeah. when they yeah. when they want to know who to call. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the well, one of the things you notice after several years is people don't people don't they actually don't really care what you say you do now. Mm-hmm. They don't even read anything about what you do now. They, they don't understand what UX is. Mm-hmm. They don't understand any anything really when it boils down to it. What um, what what they do, what they remember is that you did a good job last time, yes. and, you, and you did it yeah. around this thing. Mm-hmm. So so what I see more and more is that I'll be called up to do that thing again, maybe six years later. I might not really want to do that thing anymore. Mm-hmm. But in some situations, it's a case of of saying yes. And then, and then we're back to that whole thing of like buying, um, you know, sale or at least kind of listening to their needs, yeah. working out what they really want, and then kind of mm. advising them about that instead of just the yeah. thing they were yes. they thought they were going to ask you for. It's easier to sell when you're already in. <laughs> yeah, well, you find the real problem, yeah. or you find the kind of the the, the other problems. So I mean, yeah. you might call it kind of um, add-on sales, but it's not done in a pushy way. It's not done in a mm. forceful way because you're just you're just listening. Yeah. So you're picking up on other things while you're there and offering useful answers or solutions yeah. instead of forcing a certain product mm-hmm. on someone or a certain service, which is often the case with the, the sales-driven organization. Exactly. Mm. I realize how... Uh, how do you say pot can in English? Yep, spoiled. 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 How spoiled I am. Yeah. I said spoiled, but how spoiled I am. That must be an English American British American difference, I guess. I don't know. How spoiled. That makes more sense. Yeah, I would say spoiled. But I'm not I, I, <laughs> That's a whole thing. No, it's not. <laughs> My children are spoiled. Um I spoiled them last week. Oh. Sure, but I am spoiled, is what you would say. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so now we, we figured that out. So I I realize I'm really spoiled because I don't have to do sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And and I, that's one of the most common questions I get from other freelancers is how do I do sales? But I don't have to. And I don't know exactly. I can't pinpoint what I'm doing right, but the combination of stuff I'm doing with the talks, with the blogging, with the templates I'm putting out, with the free ebooks, mm-hmm. just being visible to others so that once they get a need, they know that they, that's my name that is at the top of their head, mm. on top of their mind. Yeah, I mean, you've got, two, you've got at least two advantages. That mm. you're, not, you're not junior. Yeah. You've not just come out of school and exactly. trying to find your yeah. initial work, your first clients. Um, and, um, well, you, you, do, you have delivered stuff over a long period of time. Mm. So you, you can afford to, well, you have got the network. Mm. Um, but, uh, but you're, if you're straight out of school and don't have any clients and you become a freelancer, then I can get that first job. Mm. It's tougher. And Vijay uh, here um, says about freelance job portals. Now, I don't have any experience with using freelance job portals. No, exactly. I, I know they're around. I know uh, other people use them. Apart from my, I buy services from Fiverr. Exactly. And that, I wanted to talk about Fiverr as well. Now, uh, quickly answering Vijay's question there about uh, uh, freelance job portals is a good place to, to look. What I've, my impression of them is, yes, it's a, maybe a good place to, to get some little gigs, but you have to be very careful about what's included um, so you don't end up working thousands of hours for mm-hmm. absolutely no money. And generally, the money in those that you get from those portals for gigs is um, lower than for real clients that are kind of more directly yours, yeah. um, or more organically yours, I guess you could say. Fiverr. 
Fiverr, I mean, if you're starting out, Fiverr is a great place to sell your services. Good suggestion. Actually. Going back to what the question we had at, at the beginning uh, about ways you could simulate projects. Right. Um, and I, excellent. Yes, that will be fun. I thought maybe you I should could try that. actually um, offer certain services on mm -hmm. Fiverr and um, yeah, and get to do I'll real. Re tasks. I'll redesign your start page. I'll I'll look at your form. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. For, maybe not for five dollars. You do something for five. Well, why not for five dollars? Mm -hmm. Because that's how Fiverr works. You need to offer at least one service for five dollars, but then you can have add-ons and stuff. Oh, you time based So, like you, yeah. you kind of like um, yeah, uh, review mm -hmm. review review some text. Right. Um, five dollars for every thousand words mm -hmm. or whatever. Hundred. Words. And what I do when I go into Fiverr to look for services, like I need a translation services the other week, uh, I look at the recommendations they have and the reviews, and that's the good thing about Fiverr. You get reviews. So you're always struggling to get good reviews, of course, and uh, that's a great way to, just to show off. That's a great, great way to build a portfolio as well. And then back again to listening, communicating, mm -hmm. delivering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you get to do all those aspects, you know, just these little projects through, through Fiverr. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if money isn't the object, which you, if you're just getting experience or want to kind of test things, then, yeah, like you say, $5 for something mm -hmm. on Fiverr, why not put it out there? Mm -hmm. It's a marketplace. Yes. How did you get started? Uh, I was lucky, I guess, because I... We all are to do to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess everything happens by chance, mostly. Uh, well, I, I wasn't even done with a massive when I got the employment at Microsoft. So I started off as a trainee, and then I stayed for six years. Mm -hmm. And that's this whole story, <laughs> almost. Oh, really? Yes. And then I... I decided I wanted to do something else, getting more into design and feel like I own the project instead of just being part of a 800,000 800, people's company. 800,000 people. Or 80,000, <laughs> I know. I no, 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 it's It's scary numbers. Yes, it's a lot of numbers, so I decided to look for other opportunities. And when this PhD position opened, I thought it was very interesting, and that's where I am right now. Mm. And I guess I'm also a little bit spoiled in this situation that I, I haven't had to apply for that many jobs. Exactly. And haven't mm -hmm. had to sell. Well, I, I did have to go to interviews for these two jobs I've had, but um, yeah, but I haven't had to sell services or try to so find my own customers. So how many interviews have you gone to where you didn't get the job? Zero. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Maybe two or three. Mm. No, more actually. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah. You really want to forget about those. Yes, <laughs> I almost well, no, did. No, 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 you don't have to forget about them. They're they're all part yeah, of the Yeah, I mean, but your brain like suppresses yeah. the memory oh, of them. Oh, you mean like yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Of yeah. course, yeah, you, they get. Um, I was, thinking at, I was thinking at first, I can't remember one. And then I started, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. And oh, that, that one. one. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep that in compiling. <laughs> this is a fun story. So I actually applied for a job for a web strategist or web strategist. And uh, uh, this was back in 2000. And it like it was perfect for me. It was written like it had. I could check everything off. It was exactly what I wanted to work with. Mm. And it didn't even call me for an interview. No, oh, somebody's calling. I had to point to the screen really yeah. quickly there because, um, um, ah, James, he's also called in before. Waiting for James to get in the call. I'm hoping internet will bring him in. Mm. Oh, it's kind of, it's fighting, you can see, it's, yeah. kind of, it's, it's pulsing and struggling, it's kind of really, come on, come on, it's like, like it's so close. Oh, 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 here we go. Look, something's happening. Oh, no. Oh, hold on. Please start many cam. Choose another video source. Uh, can you hear me at all? We, we yes, can we hear you. you. We can hear you. We yeah. can only see an advert. Um, uh. <laughs> we can hear you, guys. So... Oh, this That's is a, like an advanced spam technique. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of like the way you roll. Kind of, can, you hear me? can you see my advert? 
yeah. Sorry about that. Not sure what's going on there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on my desktop rather than my phone. So. Um, hey, James, you're um, you're you're um, you're someone else who's also um, uh, talked to us before. In fact, it's um, it's exactly a year. Well, it's, yes. No, it's over a year ago. It's March 2015. You actually um, joined us for a little chat on one of our first um, list of That's orders. right. And at that point, I was uh, looking for a job, um, having done a UX course and, and having been a digital manager, digital media manager for the past 10 years, um, and looking to get into UX. Um, and since then, I've got a job as a user researcher with the Home Office in the UK government, Ooh. Okay, uh, which cool. is fantastic. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of pretty much a kind of dream job. You know, I was trying to get into the public sector side of things and working with government digital service and all the, the great stuff that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I, the reason I wanted to call in really was to kind of ask you a question and, and also kind of help promote the uh, work that uh, government digital service are doing uh, around accessibility and uh, access needs. One of the things that we're trying to do in Home Office is not just make accessibility the last thing on the list, you know, one of the things you test at the end, but bring it all the way up to when we're actually doing discovery uh, in user research to actually interview people who have access needs. That's things like disability, uh, disabilities, dyslexia, deafness, impairments, uh, cognitive issues, whatever, to make sure that when we're actually building our services that uh, we're, we're serving those people. Because um, at the end of the day, government has to serve all these people. There's no choice about it. And mm -hmm. so we're really trying to make sure that we're doing that work up front. And wondering if you had any uh, experience of doing that and acts finding those type of people to do interviews and, and research with. Oh, excellent. So I work with National Health Services in Sweden. So we basically have the same responsibility. We really need to make sure it works for everybody. And uh, there haven't been a lot of people, uh, actually, to be frank, focusing on these issues over the past few years when we've been building these these uh, e-services for for everyone in Sweden. Uh, I'm one of the few who has been been bringing up the issue uh, a lot more. Uh, I I'm aware of of what we need to do on a technical side. I know there's so much more. Uh, like the technical side covers like 20, 25 percent of, of what needs to be done. So uh, I've been really promoting the, the, the idea of, of trying to bring in people as well. In Sweden, there are patient organizations uh, that you can bring in that are, that are uh, making themselves available for these types of tests. So I know that is actually starting uh, this autumn. They're going to be bringing in at least every six months uh, a group of people who will be testing these e-services. We don't build a whole lot of new services so it's more around the fact of looking at what's available right now and what are the issues and making sure that we can work around those issues with these together with these people mm -hmm. I've um, some of the organizations I've worked with um, here in Sweden they've um, like you said there's, there's, um, there's a panel or rather that they've already got a list of people who have opted in to help out with things mm. Um, it, um, the one example is a trade union that they did some work with, and they they'd ask their members if they were okay to basically be asked mm. at some point in the future to take part in testing. And, and there are companies here that help you build up those kind of mm. um, panels of, of, of exactly. people. Um, but I, I think when it comes to these real niche um, types of interview, mm. um, people with maybe you know, disabilities or, or kind of um, uh, accessibility you know, challenges. Mm. Um, I think you're going to struggle if you don't use a specialist organization to help with recruitment, actually. Because yeah. it's, it's time consuming. And also, as you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned a couple of disabilities there, and it's, it's so easy to group them all under the same umbrella uh, accessibility. Mm. But I mean, motor, cognitive, deafness, um, uh, it's, they're all different. And I think we should be mm. perhaps yeah. even talking about them as specific instead of talking about accessibility. Yeah. Uh, in Sweden, we, we actually change, there's a new word for people with disabilities, and it's called functional variations. So we're now, now we're using that word instead. Mm -hmm. uh, so and then you're realizing, so it's, yeah, it's about variations in what you can do and what you can process and what you can 
even use based on, mm. I mean, motor disabilities is, is a great example, making buttons big enough mm. for people to click, even if they have like uh, hands that shake when they're using their mouse. Uh, there are so, so many aspects of it. And it's just, for me, it's, I've given talks at, 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 uh, at my clients where, where we work with the health services several times. And just, it's always amazing to see how many people are unaware of, of, of even people with, um, uh, who are, well, partially blind, which is more, more often the case, that they actually use the internet. And still, I mean, I've been talking about this for 15 years, and still people are surprised that blind people are using the internet. So there's so much education yeah, that has yeah. to be done. There's so much uh, promotion of even the concept of, of, of this thing happening uh, that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we all need to be doing as UXers, actually. Absolutely. And this is actually one of the reasons why uh, we prefer to refer to people's access needs uh, mm -hmm. rather yeah. than their disability. Uh, yeah. In many ways, we're not actually interested in what their disability is. It's what is the issue that they have with using our service. Yeah. Um, and But all of us are only temporarily not disabled. You know, All of us are going to grow old and lose sight exactly. and lose hearing or yes. mobility. Yeah. Um, in bright sunlight, you can't see your phone when you're driving, yeah. you can't use your hands, mm -hmm. and so on. So, you know, all these things, they're actually access needs for everybody mm -hmm. at different times. Yes. Uh, and it's just that some people kind of have those uh, all the time. Yeah. So one of the things that um, we're trying to do is uh, we're running a survey, Gov.uk uh, are running a survey at the moment on uh, assistive technologies. We really want to find out which... Uh, screen readers and uh, screen magnifiers or text-to-speech or whatever uh, technology people are using so that we can do better at uh, serving uh, the right kinds of, uh, of systems and we can actually get a bit of a, a clearer matrix of you know which um, systems and versions of, of technologies are actually being used. You know, lots of people are on very old versions of JAWS because it's so expensive, yeah. for example, um, and those old versions don't uh, you know, serve current web technologies too well uh, a lot of the time, for example. Um, so, yeah, really encourage people to go and find that survey and, and um, fill it out if they haven't already so we can actually build services that are better for them. Excellent. I think it's a, it is an excellent point you make, though, about um, I suppose con context based accessibility issues. Mm -hmm. that, that there, are, there are times when all of us have accessibility issues i mean you could be you could be like um you know you're, you're you've got a newborn baby and you're feeding the baby at two in the morning from the sofa mm -hmm. and you're trying to kind of like do something on your mobile in your left hand mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly then you've got you're disabled mm -hmm. but you don't see yourself as disabled mm -hmm. but your context mm -hmm. creates accessibility accessibility mm -hmm. issues that wouldn't normally be there yeah mm -hmm. that's actually a good example because that's i think that has been brought up in talks by uh, like the insurance for when you get for, in Sweden, we get insurance paid out when kids are ill. So when you report that, that you want that the kids are ill, you always have a screaming, feverish baby at home or a kid at home, and you're not really focused on the website. You're more focused on your kid, and so they actually did some things to huh. make that process simpler. Yeah, exactly. A good, good, good reminder mm -hmm. that we're we're all we're all a little bit disabled. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose we are. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, James, for, for, for calling in. We're actually running over time uh -huh. now. And, um, I indeed. It's been good to hear you again, and I'm really pleased that you, it's, Thank it's, you it's last year's worked out for you. Yeah, it's a great issue to bring up. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's, Thank uh, you. Great, great to speak to you again, and uh, always learning from you guys and uh, always uh, relaying those to, to my colleagues. So thanks very much for all your efforts. Uh, maybe much. see you at Interact London, I don't know. Okay, bye -bye. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna be yeah, we're gonna be there this October. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun to be in London again. Bye bye, bye bye, James. <laughs> but again, kind of like wrapping up with a talk, and they're not asking you to kind of give something. Oh, so you can do that now. <laughs> oh, I don't have much experience with that. Although, I I think uh, his point of um, speaking about age as a kind of thing. I mean, everybody's moving are getting older mm -hmm. and people usually don't think about that as a as a limited way of interacting with interfaces but that's you know an important group of people that we have to design stuff for as well mm -hmm. because eventually those users are going to become us hopefully yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and I, yeah. yeah, I've actually made the point, I think, it seems that as we are growing older, more people are thinking about accessibility because mm -hmm. we are now the target group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. true. <laughs> like big type on websites. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's become so popular now because all the geeks have grown old. <laughs> well, it's got, it's got, every year it's got, a, it's got bigger with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is, it is now um, seven minutes past four. Mm -hmm. And we said we'd run till four o'clock. Yeah. So we're a little bit over time. Um, anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Remember to keep moving. Oh, we'll see you on the other side. Um, <laughs> yeah, Stay we, curious. Exactly. <laughs> but we, um, well, first, of all, first of all, first and foremost, um, thank you to everyone who's been watching and been chatting with us um, in the live chat, and um, to um, all of you that called in, um, Simon and Gabe and Lacey and um, James. And we've had questions as well from VJ, Lacey, Adam, uh, oh, God, there's probably even more that I've asked questions and I haven't um, realised uh, or I haven't noted it down. Uh, it's been really, really good fun today mm -hmm. in the warmth of Stockholm in Ax Studio Axpo. And we'll we'll do another one again probably in September? September? I, I don't know. Do you have the schedule in Shallow? It'll be it'll be around. I just turn up end of August, beginning of September. Yeah. I think it's probably going to be around that time. Um, we'll do another um, yeah. live. James has just put out a survey in the chat. Mm. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if we can include that in the um, in the show notes. In the show notes. Yeah. Excellent. Always yeah. great fun doing this. Thanks for all your feedback. It's wonderful. It's why we keep doing this. Uh, yeah. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. And stay curious. There you go.